Well, here we are. It is June 2nd, 2023, and this is the weekly video. As I say each week, we do these every Friday. We take a look and see what's been going on uh, in the Asian art market, the auction market during the last week. And I'm going to start out by saying this week was a very rough week around here. We had a lot of technical problems with eBay in particular, uh, that their items were not displaying properly on the uh, newsletter page. And a lot of you noticed it, that the images, that the link, the link would appear, but the images don't. And we've been working around it, dealing with them and some other stuff going on with that company. And they, they seem to be getting it slowly resolved. But you'll still see that there are a number of items. Last week, by Saturday, none of the items were showing only the, only the, the print descriptions. And uh, they seem to be somehow working it out. I'm not sure what it is. But you'll still find some blanks on here. So if you read a description and there's no picture, Click the link and it'll take you over there anyway, and then you can decide uh, what you think of the item. But as you can see here, some of the items are on, some of the items aren't. Um, it seems to me that uh, right now a lot of the items that are displaying most easily are the ones that have already sold, which is kind of counterproductive. But some of the items that have sold aren't 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 appearing, and I have no idea why. And they don't they're they're working on it, and we, we changed some of the uh, things on the back end of our site to try to accommodate whatever it is eBay is doing, and uh, eventually it'll get there. But uh, that's been we had wanted to do a video uh, this week on the on the Christie's results and what happened over in Hong Kong, but we got so tied up in this we literally couldn't do it. All right, and some of you may encounter on some of the listings. Um, they're, they're resolving this. Another issue was that they had the uh, items uh, not appearing. If you click the link, and it would say the item has been removed or no longer available. Okay, that has been fixed. They, they have finally fixed that. I understand they did it last night, actually, literally last night. Uh, so that should, the pages images should load now. But they're now having a new problem with a CAPTCHA um, a requirement appearing under in, in the uh, text uh, text area of some listings. In order to see to see the descriptions and additional photos on some listings, they're now requiring a CAPTCHA. And when you click the CAPTCHA, it doesn't open up the listing. So it's a malfunction. I was on the phone with eBay this morning about it, and um, they, they seem to be maybe getting it resolved, but it's 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 going to be a little bit bumpy for the next day or two. All right. So I just thought I'd bring that up. I'm sorry to go over all this, but this is what's been going on around here. It's been a nutty week, and uh, we tried to enjoy Memorial Day. I hope all of you did, and uh, we were back to work on Tuesday trying to get all this stuff resolved. And uh, it's getting there. It's getting there, but it's always something. It's always something. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, um, as many of you know, that we, our site is at eBay. Uh, we're part of the eBay Partner Network, and how that works is basically we're affiliates. And a lot of you know this. You've seen the EPN logo, this blue, blue logo on our site since, since the, I don't know, for the last six or seven years. Um, and what they're doing now is they're requiring us to add all this text in here saying that if you buy something off our site, and uh, or if, you, if you click a link off our site and go to eBay and buy something, um, they pay the, the, our platform a, a, a tiny commission out of their commission. It's, a, it's called a shared revenue or something. And uh, just so you know, that, that's one of the ways that we, we've, we that it doesn't produce a lot of revenue, but it, it, it helps uh, carry the cost of running the site. That's really what the point behind it is. That's one of the revenue streams we need in order to pay for this, the servers each month and all the updates on the plugins and all that good stuff. So if you're seeing this text appearing and you're wondering what it is, that's what it is. Um, and they have, the, we have, they have the same thing on Amazon and all, all these sites. When you click those links, as you all know, you, 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 you end up often uh, um, enabling uh, somebody who sent you there uh, to make a small commission on the, um, on, on the sale if you, if you buy something. And it's very small, and, uh, they, they, and half the time they don't pay. So anyway, that's that's what's going on. Uh, and I wanted to get over here and talk a little bit about um, some things that are coming up on the uh, over on the live auctioneers through the global pages. Just a few items to get started because some really interesting things popped up. One of them is this uh, very nice Canton Familrose Royal Quasar Punch Bowl. And this is coming up at Alex Cooper's. This is about a 14 and a half inch punch bowl. And it has um, one of the Quajar Perrier uh, 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 leaders on, on the bowl with Arabic script, of course, on the other side. Here's the interior of it. This is a pretty rare bowl. And it's, it's in rose, man, rose medallion or rose mandarin. And it was made probably around 1840 or 50, according to this circa 1865. 
Um, and it's the, is it the Shah Nasser el Din Shah, the Shah of Iran. During the Quajar uh, period, he ruled from 1848 to 1896. And uh, he was basically, as it says in the description, the Quajar version of Queen Victoria. Um, he was a very prominent figure. And uh, this is a rare plot bowl. And they've got a pretty big estimated uh, as, as estimate on it. It's four to 6000 and a starting price of 2000 and uh, as we've seen before with these Arabic inscribed bowls and, and Middle Eastern market bowls, they do very well. And I think this one should should do this. I don't think two thousand dollars for a bowl with this decoration on it is is at all unreasonable. A fourteen inch bowl. Think of it this way: a fourteen inch bowl in this size, with just the the standard rose medallion decoration in it from that period, would be worth probably oh, six to six hundred and fifty on the low end, up to maybe eight or nine hundred dollars, somewhere in that range. This one has a faint hairline in it, as I recall. But when you have something this specific for this kind of a, a person. Um, and uh, they're saying it was his bowl. I'm not so sure. Often they did these bowls and they put portraits on them to commemorate certain leaders. All right. This may have been in his collection. I have no way of knowing and they don't seem to know. Uh, they're just saying it was made for. And it, but, it may, but they may have meant made in honor of. But regardless, it's a rare bird. And if you like rare export wares of the 19th century, this is one of the rarest ones we've seen in, 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 in probably the last year and a half. All right, and the other thing on his sale is this, a very nice gugglet with handles, serpentine handles, 18th century blue and white. Uh, they're dating it to about 1760 to 70, which is pretty close. Uh, came from a good collection. The estimate is 12 to $1,500, $600 opening bid. It already has a bid. The sale is in about eight days. Uh, it, should bring, it should bring the estimate. It should bring 12 to $1,500. It's a pretty nice piece of porcelain. If you, if, you, if you like this kind of export wear and you've wanted to own one, this is a good one. And it's, the handle doesn't seem to have been broken, and it's got its original cover, which is almost a miracle. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you've sort of wanted one of these as a complete example, that's one to consider. And uh, Tremont, um, in, uh, here in the Boston area, Tremont Gallery, they've got a sale coming up in about ten, nine days. And uh, they have some Chinese things in the sale, but they have a lot of, this time around, it seems to me their best stuff is the chi uh, Japanese material. There's some very nice Japanese pottery. There's a slew of inros and netskis, some very nice netskis and some very nice inros. So if you're a Japanese buyer, check out the Tremont auction um, on the global pages this week. And the other thing I wanted to mention too was that Eritor Galleries, this is, these are Chinese watercolors, these are amazing. Um, Eritor Galleries is tied to Graham Eritor, was a very famous um, a print dealer for, for, during the, during the, the 1900s. Um, and they handle only the best stuff. They're, they supply museums, they sell top, top line material. And um, they've got this, uh, they've got several of these paintings of butterflies on paper. Um, and these are really, really nice, very fine work. Um, I don't know how they're dating them, actually. Um, are they dating them as 19th, 19th century? If they're 19th century, they're early 19th century school paintings. Um, they're good size, 13 by 17. Frame size, they're, they are 19 by 23. These are big, and these are really good frames on these. I should always point out the frames because frames are very expensive. And this looks like about, a, about an $800 to $1,000 frame from what I can see. And then you have the painting. So the opening, uh, the opening price of uh, twenty five hundred dollars is not unreasonable for this. They're estimated at five to eight thousand. If you're an export painting uh, collector, they have two of these with insects on them. I think they're great. And the other thing that they've got is they've got four paintings on pith by Tin Kua. and uh, from the Tin Kua studio, they've got all the information on it. Um, and they're really good ones, and they don't appear to be cracked or damaged. They look like they're in really nice condition. And again, nicely flame framed, very tastefully done. And these are on pith. These are very, very fine. Those of you who know about Tin Kua, he, was a Cant he had a Cantonese gallery, now known as Guangzhou, of course. No, they don't call it Canton anymore. Uh, but there are four of these, as I recall, of uh, port and harbor scenes uh, done around uh, 1850 or 60. Um, 18, they're dating it as 1845 to 1855. Um, they're framed, they are 12 inches by 17. These are very, very nice, $1,000 opening bid. Um, they're worth every penny. And as I said before, the frame is probably a six or $700 frame on these. And there's a set of four. So if you wanna have a nice set of four of really good watercolors by the Tin Kwa Studio, 
Uh, these are it. These, this, these are absolutely splendid quality. Here's another one of the of the ships in 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 the, in the port. Uh, beautifully done, uh, as you'd expect. And they all have the same estimates. And then we're on a painting binge, I guess, this week. I'm not sure. <laughs> Clark Gallery um, in Larchmont, uh, up in New York, has a sale coming up. And I noticed these two very nice 19th century ink drawings of uh, figures. Uh, uh, here you have a, a, an elder approaching two very elegantly dressed ladies. And then you have some um, uh, traveling folks turning up at a house. And there's a veranda here, very nicely done, beautifully framed, nice old frames. I like these old frames. They're a little bit rusticated. Um, they maybe have been banged around a little bit, but these are nice watercolors. There's the back of it. Uh, it may just be the light. Maybe it's just the light that makes them look older than they are. Oh, no, no, it's, a, it's like a bronzy uh, finish on the frame. But at any rate, uh, th these are nice paintings. And, and the, uh, the opening estimate on these, I think, is very, very low. $250 with a five to $700 uh, estimate. Um, I would think they're, they're worth that for each one, and, it's, and there's two of them. It's a pair. All right, so check that out. And uh, the other thing they've got is a bunch of Japanese woodblock prints in this sale um, uh, coming up. This is at Clark um, in about a week. So if you're interested in that, and they have a couple of very rare books, incidentally, by um, uh, Oddsley and Bose. Who printed these? They they were these were printed in America. These amazing, uh, high quality art reference books on Japanese art. And if you're a collector of Japanese art, you know about Oddsley and Bowes. And they have both. They have two sets up here, um, connected to him uh, in their first editions, limited editions. I think these are one of them was I think was volume. It was the 160th of the uh, of the printing. Um, so the limited edition. They probably only did at the most maybe a thousand copies. In the back in the day all right so that's worth looking at and then over to ebay a lot of stuff sold last week and the prices were pretty good despite the fact that the, they, they couldn't get the pages to load and they're having all these technical issues and they did pretty well you have this jardinier um uh, a rose mandarin jardinier with a celadon background this was a very nice one with a shaped rim rather unusual if you're looking at it you say that's a, you don't see those very often and you're right you don't uh, and this one was quite finely painted and looks like it was probably done right around the first half, the end of the first half of the 19th century. Very nicely painted, beautifully done. Um, they have these uh, unglazed, uh, typical unglazed bottoms. It looks like they blocked the hole of the drain hole in the bottom because this originally would have had a, a, would have been this with an under tray. It probably would have been a pair. So there would have been two under trays and two of these platters, uh, but one of them made it. Um, and the other one may be somewhere else, who, who knows, but often they get broken. Um, or they get left out and they freeze and crack and that's the end of it. Uh, but anyway, this was a nice one. Ended up selling for $1,089, but a, a very unusual form. Very, very unusual. And then over here to this, they, they, this was a, a clobbered Kung Chi period gin bottle or square bottle as they call them. Um, I don't think he mentioned that it was clobbered in the, in the title, but it is. This is definitely clobberware. Uh, but a nice squared uh, uh, early example, probably uh, early 18th century. Uh, very, very nice. And uh, somebody picked it up for $1,089, which I think is pretty good. Undecorated, without the clobbering, these typically bring around 12 to $1,500. Um, and for some reason, sometimes when they clobber them, they, they, it actually keeps the price down, which I don't understand because I think these, these are more, obviously rarer because <laughs> uh, they didn't clobber all of them. But uh, this one, you, you all know what clobbering is, right? It's when they would get blue and white porcelain brought into Europe, Holland, and they would have uh, painters there add color, add these pigments. This was originally just the blue and white you see there. And then they would add their own pigments um, to color them in a little bit, dress them up, make them a little fancier. And this was sort of a thing for a long time over there. And occasionally you'll see whole collections of clobberware. We've talked about them before. They're very, it's a very interesting area of study. And I hope somebody at some point comes up with a really good book on clobberware. If you know of a really good book, I haven't seen one. But if you know of a good book on the topic, I'd love to see it because I, it would be worth reading. All right. And uh, then over here to this, that flambe uh, vase we talked about last week with the enamels. Uh, this was a really nice face. I like this a lot, as I said. Um, it, it had a break at the mouth, had an old break around the mouth, but, but very nicely decorated, beautiful flambe glaze, nice enameling. And uh, in the end, it did pretty well. It, with the, even with the break, as I thought, it, it brought $1,026. And I think we talked about what it would bring, and I think I said 800 to 1,200 or 1,000 to 1,200, somewhere in there. 
And that's what it came in with. And the shipping wasn't bad on this. I was kind of happy to see that. Uh, this was sold over in Kent in the UK. And the shipping on that from there to here in the US was only $85. And those of you who've been shipping lately know how much shipping rates have gone up. So that's a pretty good deal. <clears throat> now uh, over to, <clears throat> oh, this, the uh, silk. Nice silk, um, um, sort of a deep maroon silk ground. Very unusual color. Um, and it looks like it was cut from something else because this has a border on three sides, but not on the fourth. And I suspect it was part of a larger panel, but very nicely done and uh, almost a, like, a, like a silk velvet tone. There were some splits in it, obviously, but unusual color, nicely done and pretty good size. And in the end, it did pretty well. It brought uh, brought $1,035. And that's, again, the strength of the silk market uh, seems to be almost never ending. And uh, on the global page, as many of you know, there's a huge sale of silks coming up. So keep an eye on that sale. It comes up in a, in a, in a week or two. All right. And then there was another piece of silk here. This was the, the fragment from a, from a hanging panel of some kind or, or part of a robe um, with, a, with a dragon above with a bat and then the waves and uh, the, the rainbow pattern that they love to use on these. Uh, but nicely done, nicely framed, uh, put inside a, a new silk border running around it. And it ended up selling for $743. And, uh, and then this, the uh, Qinlong, uh, Yong Chen uh, Qin, to Qinlong period Lotus Bowl. Uh, we talked about this last week because this is one of those, those, this is one of those export bowls that everybody likes. Everybody thinks these are so pretty because they are. Um, and, they, and there's always an inter interest in the market for them. This wasn't a big piece. It was about nine or 10 inches in diameter. Very nicely painted, nice lotus work on the outside and the inside, as you can see. Uh, there was nothing really to complain about it for. And uh, in the end, it did pretty well. It brought $1,126. This was from a seller out in Glendale, Arizona. Uh, very nice piece of blue, very nice piece of 18th century export wear. And then this, this was sort of one of, the, one of the better buys of the week. Maybe one of you knows something more about this. Uh, but this is one of these uh, China Trade export urns. They were typically made in pairs. Um, they were made, this particular one is done sort of in the, in the American federal style um, with the stars and the cobalt overglazed blue enamels and all this business, the pistol handles. And these are, these are fairly big. I don't know, this, this one is probably 15 or so inches tall. And they go on, they, often people have them on mantles, 16 inches tall. There you go. This one, I think, went under the money a bit. It went and let maybe and maybe some of you checked on this or something. Maybe it's got a huge repair or something, but it went for eight hundred and fifty-six dollars, which is very inexpensive for one of these. Um, um, uh, I normally singles of these uh, bring somewhere in the sort of at a minimum of around twelve or thirteen hundred and up as much as twenty-two hundred dollars typically. Pairs can even bring more. Um, 856 for this was, I think, a very good buy. And a really nice grisaille decoration, too, in, the, uh, in here. The, the, the grisaille decoration on this was fantastic. Um, this European uh, scene, um, or Western scene, uh, the, the, in China they would paint these. Um, but in this style, with this cobalt, these, were typically, uh, these are typically associated with export wares for the American market when they have this appearance to them, very much in keeping with the federal federal period tradition and so forth. And uh, how people that collect federal furniture, American furniture, often have these with a big bullseye mirror on each side, uh, in the middle with two of these on each side and all that. All right, and then over here to this, a very quirky, uh, interesting um, uh, uh, tea caddy. And I had a couple of inquiries about this. They wanted to know what we thought of it, and we liked it a lot. Uh, unusual form. Um, usually these, as you know, are square. This one is, 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 is sort of a bowed shape on one side and then has this invected front with the, with the with this escutcheon for the key recessed inward. Um, there's a view of it. That's where the escutcheon is. So it has this very unusual shape with conforming um, um, uh, pewter tea caddies. Um, uh, the tea caddies have their covers and had, had their outer covers and inner covers, both covers. This one goes in first and then you put this one over it to keep it sealed nice and tight. And then you close the thing and lock it. Um, to keep the tea fresh, all right? And the, the, the interesting thing about tea caddies is the tea caddies started out, they were always fairly small, um, unless you were really wealthy, and then you might take a, get a big one, because tea was so expensive, especially in the 18th and into the early 19th century, it was very expensive. And people had tea caddies to lock the tea up so the servants and people wouldn't steal it. 
Uh, and, the, and that's why you see a lot of 18th century English tea caddies that are about this big. And if you see ever see a really big 18th century tea caddy, um, that usually, whether it's a, made from a piece of Chinese porcelain, which we've seen, where they'll put a hinge on the, on the jar and a latch and all that, or on a large uh, 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 wooden one, um, those were symbols of wealth. When you had a big tea caddy, like the size of a 24-inch um, uh, export jar, you know, or a pair of them both set up as tea caddies, if you could afford those tea caddies, you were a very wealthy person um, because they were very expensive uh, by, the, by the ounce back in the day. It got much cheaper, of course, into the 19th century because the supplies increased. But anyway, that's the story. About people always say, why did they lock tea caddies? And they locked it because it was such an expensive, exotic thing. And um, people would snitch it, uh, especially that worked for uh, well-to-do families, and they would snitch a little tea, um, and uh, eventually it would disappear, and somebody would say, where the heck did all the tea go? All right. Anyway, this was a nice tea caddy. <clears throat> Unusual form, and I hope one of you bought it. It had its original wooden feet on it. Often they are missing on, on these old tea caddies, these lacquered tea caddies. They all, were ha they all originally had pretty much wooden feet, um, most of them. Some of them didn't, some of them do. But you can check underneath because you can see where the, where the holes were, where they fitted it in. And they get knocked off and they had, uh, for a time, they were replacing them with metal feet. But metal feet are not the traditional feet they put on tea caddies. Anyway, this one did fine. It ended up selling for $485 in beautiful condition. I think it was a great buy because it's, it's a much better type than some of the square ones because of the form. And uh, it went for about the same price. So good deal. And then this, this 19th century uh, 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 blossom plaque with endless knots all over it, probably out of a screen. Uh, nice looking plaque, pretty good size, as you can see the, by the dollar bill that's sitting next to it. Oh, here's one of those capture things. See, this is the thing I was talking about where you can't get to the item description. Let's see if it works now. And um, maybe it doesn't work. And then you, this is for stadiums, so you click off all the little stadiums. Let's see if it works. It didn't work earlier. I'm hoping it'll work now. Otherwise, we'll reload the... No, nope, doesn't work. This is a nuisance. This is, the, this is the problem. If you get to an item and you can't uh, get to all the images, contact the seller and ask them. All right. Um, okay. Uh, that seems to have helped clear it up a little bit. There we go. Some of them aren't clearing up. This one is... This one they dated is 1900 to 1940. I don't think it is. I think it's older than that. I think it's probably around 1850 or 60. It was a nice piece of blue and white. And in the end, it did fine. It brought $768. And uh, moseying along over to here, the snuff bottle with underglazed red and blue. This is a very nice snuff bottle. Um, here it is on the uh, on the bottom. It had a, a, a spurious uh, young chen mark on there. Uh, but very, very strong underglazed red. And as all of you know, and we've talked about it many times, is underglazed red is a, it, firing underglazed red in porcelain and underglazed blue in porcelain is a tricky affair because they both bloom their colors at different temperatures, basically, is what it amounts to, under slightly different conditions. And if you misfire um, underglazed red, it'll turn green and uh, or it'll turn black something will happen to it and the blue can misfire and turn the wrong color too so it's unusual that it's you don't often see a piece that has a very nice underglazed red very warm soft like a, like a warm cherry red with a very nice underglazed blue this was a nice nice snuff bottle very very nice there's much more desirable than just a blue one typically and this one did fine. It sells for $1,282. And it's all because of that great underglazed red decoration of the dragon and uh, how clean and crisp that color is. It's very, very desirable. And uh, over here to this, I just wanted to touch base on this. This was that nifty little cup that we had last week that we, we talked about in the preview. Um, 18th century export cup with the gold castles on it, the gold buildings. Very unusual, really unusual treatment for a little handled, single handled cup, early uh, 19th century uh, or late 18th century, somewhere in there, Ch Chin Lung to Jai Ching period. Uh, ended up doing pretty well. It sold for $251. And this type of cup, typically, if it just has the regular Famille Rose decoration, sells for about $60 or $70. But that gilding right there and the way this cup is decorated drove that price up to $251. Um, I mean, it's too bad he doesn't have the saucer for it. Maybe you'll see the saucer come up in a couple of weeks. I've seen people do that. They'll take the cup and sell one week and the saucer the next, which I don't understand. But at any rate, 
<clears throat> and then this, the two, this is a, a 25 inch uh, uh, Famille Rose um, uh, ex 19th century export vase. Um, well known type. You've seen these before. This one was nicely decorated. I like the, uh, the butterfly decoration around the shoulder here. Very nicely, or a bird de a decoration rather, around the shoulder here. Very, very delicately painted. And very nice contrast to how the rest of the piece was painted. It was, it was a really clever uh, way of breaking up the decoration going down the piece. And there it is. This was a nice vase. Very nice colors. Looked to be in very good condition. Um, I don't think there was, I don't think it was ever drilled as a lamp. Nope, it wasn't. And uh, as I said, it's a, a, a probably just slightly after the second half of the 19th century when it was made. Uh, ended up doing pretty well. It brought $2,052, but it was 20, over 24 inches tall, 25 inches tall. So that does push the price considerably. And then over here to this, this was just a, a I, I really like this was a pretty, I like teapots as a lot of you know, um, because I, they're functional and um, they can, the, the shape let, gives themselves, to, can be awfully attractive. This was a nice little Famille Rose teapot, probably Chin Lung. Uh, nice handle on it in good shape. I didn't see a lot of damage to it. Nice long spout uh, and beautifully decorated. But the rose enamels on this were very, very fine. They were quite nice. Um, if you pull them in and look at them, that very, very nice rose rose color and overglazed blue enamels. And uh, this ended up doing pretty well. It sold for $564. And hopping along over here, a room tonic had this... Um, uh, a, a, a crack type uh, a dish. Uh, it was in very nice condition. Uh, how big was this one? Uh, da, 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 da. 12 inches. So it was a charger. It was over 12 inches, 12 and a half inches, and sold for $610, but in very good condition. Beautiful condition. Absolutely great condition. Oh, and some of you, um, he, he, he got a hold of me, this seller, I, I, I know him. He got a hold of me earlier this week because he had a bunch of listings up. And some of you, if you sell on eBay, this was another big change they did that may have thrown off the site also. They've, they've integrated and sort of forcing everybody into their, into their global shipping program. And it changed something in the way listings are created. So if you don't, if you, if you don't check the right box or you check it and then you don't do the right save or something, there's some sort of trick to it. Um, it'll, it'll tell the, the viewers this item isn't, isn't shippable out of the United States. In other words, for the U.S. only, and it'll say does not may not ship abroad. So if you come across that, you may see it on pieces where the, that's unintended by the seller. Always ask, even if they say they don't ship to another country, email and ask them if they ship to another country, because very often they say, yeah, that's a mistake. And uh, what Matt did, he took all of his listings down for the for for a part of the week, the the ones that were affected by that, and he's putting them all back up uh, tonight. So they'll be in the uh, on the newsletter page when they come back up. All right, and then over here to this uh, rare 18th century Long Quan Celadon glazed carved lotus. Thing. This was sold by Joni's up in Canada. Um, and I wanted to point out something about this. Um, the use of the word Long Quan Celadon. Long Quan was a particular area of kilns um, that stopped making uh, porcelain, stopped making Celadon around the 1550s. And it's, it's become, I, I know a lot of sellers use it all the time. They'll say it's a 19th century Long Quan Celadon or 18th century Long Quan Celadon. Long Quan kilns were gone. They didn't exist anymore. So you, you, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a Ching De Chin Celadon, um, but not a Long Quan Celadon. It was probably made in Ching De Chin or somewhere around there, uh, but not in Long Quan. Um, and it, it's become sort of a thing that's gotten to the point where it's confusing people because I had somebody say to me, uh, he bought a piece of uh, Celadon that was sold as Long Quan Celadon and it was made at the beginning of the 19th century and, I, and he didn't understand how, you know, he, how that could possibly be. And I said, well, it really can't, but it's sort of a, an expression meaning very good, people now use Long Quan in the description sort of to imply that it's a better quality or, you know, more recognized, it's a very recognizable name for people who've been collecting ceramics for any length of time. And uh, Joni's does it too, they all do it. It's not, I'm not picking on Joni's for doing that, but um, it's actually a misuse of the word. Um, so it, it, uh, there were no, there were no Long Quan Celadons in the Qing Dynasty. All right, now this, this was a nice bowl though. This was a nice uh, example, nicely done. The bottom of it looked fine, later 18th century. Um, very attractive, a little bit of fritting around there. 
and uh, ended up going. I don't think this was a crazy price, twelve hundred eighty-six dollars, and it was. Uh, this was pretty good size. I, I, I got to scroll down to see. I think it was like nine or ten inches in size. Um, nine inches high and, uh, no, excuse me, nine inches wide, rather, six inches tall. Nice size, nice shape, and it had this beautiful decoration incised into it. And I think that was a pretty good buy. The only thing that held the value down, though, there was a hair, old hairline in the bottom, and that does affect things. All right, and then this, I'm pointing this out only because uh, it was it was up there, and I, I had this listed even though it wasn't an auction item. And uh, somebody wrote in and made an offer. They were asking $619, and somebody bought it and got a really nice buy. This is another piece of clobberware, uh, very similar to that square gin bottle that we looked at. This is a, a, a blue and white uh, pot, teapot that was uh, decorated and done. And this was a very attractive one. I really liked it. And uh, the last thing was I had mentioned last week that these had been auctioned. Some of you will recall these were auctioned off the week before and for whatever reason they didn't get paid and the sellers smartly, they sold for $1,050 I think two or three weeks ago at an auction on eBay. They didn't get paid for, he relisted them and he did it the right way. He, he lowered the price slightly. Sometimes p sellers make the mistake of, of relisting at a fixed price at the, at the top price that the item sold for. So if it sold for $1,050, they would list this for $1,050. He didn't do that. They, this was pretty smart. He listed it for $975, gave, gave, took a little bit off to, to encourage some interest in it, and lo and behold, he sold it. And it sold, this sold within a couple of days. Um, so that's, that's a pretty good way to do it. And really what it does is it sort of, uh, you end up paying roughly the same price as the, as the previous one, but, but it sort of what it sold for, because the shipping um, on these were uh, a little, not heavy, $95 for two of these uh, from St. Paul, Minnesota to here in the New England area, which is, I don't think it's bad. It works out to about 45 bucks a, 45 bucks a piece for the porcelain. That's, that's sort of inexpensive these days, as many of you know. So at any rate, so that sold. He must have been very happy because those are nice. Those are very attractive. And then coming up this week, there's a bunch of things on here. Um, the uh, uh, the Shangri-La guys um, has this, this very nice Kangxi to early Yongchen period cafe, beautiful cafe color on this. If you like cafe decorated porcelains, this is a really nice tone of this cafe enamel that they used in the early 1800s, early 1700s rather. And the enameling on it was quite exceptional, beautifully decorated. And um, I, I saw that and I thought, oh, yeah, that's a good looking bowl. And here's the interior of it. I, it's hard to know which side to, to show first, the, the front of the back. But this is a very, very, very pretty. Um, he's calling it Kangxi to Yongshen period. I'm, I'm more inclined to call it Kangxi, but uh, it's, it's sort of splitting hairs. Uh, very attractive plate. Uh, how big is this thing? It is uh, nine inches in diameter, but beautiful colors. It sort of has the same feel as some Kaki Amon pieces. Lovely piece of porcelain. Um, what is it up to right now? Um, it's got five bids. It's up to $50. It just went up. It closes in, in five, nine days, uh, but leave a bid on it. This is the thing. Leave a bid. Leave a bid, um, and uh, you never know what's going to happen. Sometimes you get an absolutely amazing buy. And this is another little jar that they put up, um, a Wutsai 17th century jar, a uh, nice little pot. Um, it looks like it may have a repair um, on the uh, spout there. There's a little right in here. It might have a little old repair or something, but nice looking, $38, one bid so far. And uh, this, oh, this, 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 this. Um, if you like Chinese silver, if you, if you follow Chinese silver, this is Seller Vassar Girl, and she comes up with some interesting things. She's done in New York, um, in Buffalo. Um, this is a really interestingly done shaped st Chinese silver box with uh, with an, um, uh, colored enamels. And uh, these are highly collectible. These are really desirable. Um, uh, people that know Chinese silver uh, recognize this. Hallmark by the maker on the bottom. You can go look it up in the silver book that's over in the reference section. But very fine quality silver, probably late Qing to early Republic, but really nice. And um, the, these do awfully well. The, the, the famous Chinese silver uh, 
a guy f from years ago. Was, was I've mentioned him before. He was actually a friend of mine named Crosby Forbes, and he was the, the curator at the Peabody Essex Museum. And he had an amazing collection of Chinese silver because he became fascinated with it at a, 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 back in the 60s, and he wrote a very a good book on the topic which is sort of like one of the Bibles of, of, of the Chinese silver world and Chinese export markets. And uh, he passed away a few years ago. Um, we talked about him in another video because I bought several paintings that I had seen in his house when I was visiting him and um, I wanted to keep them. Um, I gave them to my wife for a Christmas present one year. But beautiful paintings, he had wonderful things. And he had wonderful Chinese silver with enamels, with these enamels, and that reminded me of that. <clears throat> but very, very desirable. Um, if you're a collector of Chinese silver, uh, you might want to up your game a little and take a shot at this low box. I think it's terrific. Um, right now, it, it's got, uh, it closes later today. It closes, um, uh, it closes, well, it, it closes here at 12.17 a.m. Um, uh, U.S. time. So tomorrow, Saturday morning, um, uh, at, uh, it's a strange closing time, just a little after midnight. I don't know how she did that. She's in New York. Uh, any anyway, rate, if you want to own it, uh, chase this down a little bit. It's a very nice piece of silver. Uh, and uh, how big is this box? Probably four or five inches. Um, very good condition. It's age only flaws. Uh, craftsmanship, quality, enamels, delicate. Da, da, da. Measures. Uh, oh, it's really. Oh, it's a really delicate one. It's two and a quarter inches. That really makes it interesting. Um, this is a tiny box. This is tiny. It's this big and it's beautifully done and it should do well. It should bring a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. That's a very nice form. So it's like a little pill box almost. I didn't realize how small it was. God, that's a beautiful thing. Gem, gem of an item. And uh, what else is there? Is this Satsuma bottles? Phoenix Child's got some uh, nice looking um, Satsuma up. Uh, check those out. If you're a Satsuma buyer, there's a lot of good Satsuma around lately. Another uh, uh, Chinwazari Tea Caddy. I might have mentioned this one last week. I liked it a lot because I like the I like the, uh, the the jade or hardstone uh, flower on the top. This closes in just a couple of days, as I recall, right? Two days it closes. Uh, there's a lot more. We haven't gotten them all um, together yet. And this this is a, a nice. Um, they didn't they didn't give the color and the, the the photography makes it look a little darker than it is. A little different in color. But this looks like dark tea dust glaze, and this looks like a nice piece of it. Um, there's the foot rim, there's the bottom of it, that rounded white creamy foot, this very, very nice shape with speckles all over it. And it comes with, this is the fun thing, it comes with this little sort of a guan type ram. This looks like a 20th century example to me. Uh, I don't think it's terribly old. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's just sort of a fun object. It's like thrown in with it for some reason. Uh, but the, it's, it's, it's got three days to go. It's only up to $4. And uh, the, the, I, my feeling is that this little bottle, it's sort of a miniature thing, and we know what miniature pieces have been doing lately. But this here it looks black, but in another photograph, it's got a green tinge to it. So it's probably, it, I would maybe check with the seller or get some other pictures. It looks like it's probably tea dust glaze. It closes in, in three days, four days. It closes on Tuesday of next week, so you have time to look it up. And then lastly, for fun, I threw this in because I've always liked Middle Eastern metalwork, and I've always, and many of you I know follow this because the influence of, of Middle Eastern metals on Chinese porcelains going back to the, you know, the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongols brought back metal forms, the Ming Dynasty they brought back metal forms and made them in porcelain and so forth. And I've always liked the Islamic metalwork and so forth. This is a nice, he's got it listed as 17th or 18th century. And this is tinned copper. And uh, it's a copper bowl. It has like, a, they would coat it with tin so it looked like silver. And uh, here, here's the inside. This is a nice one. But what got, what struck me is this very warm color of the copper. Um, this, this thing has been very well taken care of for a long time. It's meticulously decorated. If you like that Middle Eastern, uh, um, if you like Middle Eastern metalwork and you're interested in, in the impact that had on uh, China uh, through trade and shapes and forms and styles, 
this might be a sort of a fun thing to throw into your collection to go along with your Chinese items. Uh, the shape of the bowl is very, very pleasing. And it's a pretty good sized bowl. As I recall, I think it's 10 inches in diameter. This isn't a tiny bowl. Yeah, 27 centimeters in diameter. So it's uh, 11 inches wide. It's a good sized bowl. It's got six days to go. It's only up to $9. It should bring four or 500. It's a good bowl. Um, and uh, uh, so, so check that out. Do check that out. All right. And that, that's about it for the week. Um, hopefully we'll, things will be smoother this coming week. We get some other videos out. I've got a list of videos I want to do. And uh, I want to talk a bit about selecting, uh, how do you pick an auction house? Uh, this is something that we get asked a lot. People that get things, inherit things, and they want to know, you know, how, how, you know, how do you pick an auction house? Who, who, what do you look for if you're not in the business, if you're not in the trade? And I want to do a video about that because I think a lot of you would find it interesting because it's some of the things that go on and, and, uh, and, and how auction houses present themselves um, sometimes isn't quite as it, you, you might hope. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. And there's a couple of books I read while I was in Belize that I haven't had time to talk about. Um, and I want to get that into a video. So at any rate, um, hopefully this week, weekend and next week will be much calmer than it has been for the last week around here. And uh, we can get back to doing what we're doing. But uh, a couple of people asked, well, you know, are you going to do any videos this week? And I just said, uh, I would love to, but we're up to our eyeballs with, the, with these nuisance things um, happening with, um, with eBay's uh, technology. And um, hopefully they'll get it resolved. All right. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful weekend. It is uh, 80, almost 80 degrees here right now. Uh, Summer is here and um, very interesting uh, weather we're going to be having over the weekend, I guess. we're going Somebody said we might have a bit of a northeaster, <laughs> but we need it. The grass needs it, so um, that's fine. We'll get some rain. All right. Best to you all, and uh, we're back next week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.